As we continue to talk about the joints, um, before we go any further, I do want to show you this uh, concept of mobility versus stability. It's an important concept to understand in rehab. So your joints, whether it be ankle, knee, hip, lumbar, thoracic, or cervical spine, they are either meant to be stable and mobile. And there's a lot of uh, SFMA, uh, FMS, uh, Great Cook. There's a lot of people that have studied this phenomenon. And if you look at the ankle joint, the ankle joint itself should be mobile. Okay, and we talked about this, I think, uh, early on, but this is good, good review for you. The knee joint should be stable. The hip joint should be mobile. The lumbar spine should be stable. Your thoracic cage must be mobile and your cervical spine should be stable. Now any disruptions in this link, as you can see this nice diagram is a chain, right? You're only as good as your weakest link. So if your ankle, the perfect example I like to give is the next one we're going to talk about is your hip. You should be mobility or you should have mobility in your hip. If you don't have mobility on your hip, you're going to put stress on your knee. You're going to have stress on your back. What I mean by stress is, well, you have to get mobility somewhere, meaning you have to get movement somewhere. And if your hips are really stiff, you're going to try to get movement at your low back or you're going to try to get movement at your knee. It's only one or the other. Okay, so that is what I mean by this mobility and stability chain that you must understand. So to prevent injuries and to live a healthy life with minimal MSK problems, uh, have great mobility in your ankles, have good mobility in your hip, and have good mobility in your thoracic spine. Okay, and everything else should fall into place. Meaning, if you have issues with your knee, don't touch the knee. Work your ankle, work your hip. If you have issues with your back, work your thoracic spine and work your hips. Try to get more range of motion this way and range of motion this way. If you have good strength, good looking abs here, but if you don't have mobility in your hips, then it doesn't matter. Okay, so start with mobility first. So good mobility in your spine, good mobility in your hips, and good mobility in your ankle. And everything else should fall into place. Okay. So the hip joint is a coxal joint, uh, acetabular labrum. It's a fiber cartilage that deepens the socket. Remember, labrums, labrums deepen the socket. You have ligaments, which are iliofemoral, pubofemoral, ischiofemoral, and a round ligament. So if you look at that, here's the acetabular labrum. Here's the acetabulum. Here's the head of the femur. Here's the greater trochanter. Here's the shaft of the femur. Okay, so here's the labrum, pubis, femur. These are all ligaments. Remember, ligaments attach bone to bone, and they're named for a reason. Ischiofemoral goes from the ischium to the femur. Iliofemoral goes from the ilium to the femur. So these are all named for a reason. Okay. Cartilaginous joints. Here's the epiphyseal plate. Remember, that closes around 18 in long bones, 25 in the vertebral column. At cartilage joints, bones are united by hyaline cartilage to form a synchondrosis or by fiber cartilage to form a symphysis. The hyaline cartilage of the epiphyseal growth plate forms a synchondrosis that unites the shaft, diaphyse, and the end epiphyses of a long bone allows the bones to grow in length. The pubic portions of the right and left hips of the pelvis are joined together by fibrocartilage, forming the pubic symphysis. Okay. Here's a normal hip joint, but then here's one that's kind of got war, worn out. Okay. The hip joint is multi-axial, meaning you can go forward, backwards, medial, lateral, and rotate. So if you've got really tight hips, well, you're going to try to compensate for this movement in your back or your knee. So if you have tight hips, then you're going to compensate the knee. There's your meniscus and there's your ACL injuries. If you have tight hips and you want to compensate above, there's your herniated disc and low back pain. So now you understand the key is 
free those hips up and a lot of times your spine your back and your knee pain will get significantly less and in sports it's so important to have good mobility in the hips um, because of all the running and cutting and change of direction that you do so the knee joint tibiofemoral functions as a hinge joint you've got the lateral and medial menisci for padding you've got ligaments which are the fibular collateral ligament and the tibial collateral ligament and then you have the acl and the pcl here's the synovial joint bone bone synovial membrane you have articular cartilage so synovial joints allow for smooth movements between the adjacent bones the joint is surrounded by an articular capsule that defines a joint cavity filled with synovial fluid the articulating surfaces of the bones are covered by the thin layer of articular cartilage ligaments support the joint by holding the bones together and resisting excess or abnormal joint motions so here's the knee joint it's complex for sure here's the femur here's the tibia here's the fibula so again here's where your acl is here's where your pcl is okay so the acl prevents anterior translation of the tibia and the pcl prevents posterior translation of the tibia then you have the medial meniscus but the medial collateral ligament you have the lateral collateral ligament okay here's the fibula the head of the fibula you can see all the ligaments that attach here if you look at the posterior view here's the medial condyle again here's the acl that attaches here this is the pcl and then there's the menisci that cushions it so imagine all the torque that goes on the knee while you're playing sports unreal no wonder people tear their acls okay here's the medial meniscus and here's the lateral meniscus so the medial meniscus is more c-shaped and the lateral meniscus is more o-shaped here's the bursa okay and the bursa can get inflamed as well you have a super patella bursa you have a pre patella bursa you have an infra patellar fat pad you have an infra patella bursa so you have a lot of bursas in your knees that's why you can get a lot of knee pain because this bursa can get inflamed from repetitive running jumping etc so here look at this dislocation look at that kneecap go boop yep that's his kneecap way up there so that's a patellar dislocation or it could be a quadriceps tendon tear where his quad just tore okay now the ankle joint talocrural joint anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments multi-part media deltoid multi-part lateral ligament and then you have the achilles tendon okay so we've seen many achilles tendon ruptures boogie cousins kevin durant charles barkley name it If you look at the foot here, again the tibia and the fibula, um, here's the most commonly injured ligament during an ankle sprain is the ATFL. So that's your anterior talofibular ligament. So it goes from your talus to your fibula. So that's why it's called the anterior talofibular ligament then you have a calcaneal fibula so it goes from a calcaneus to your fibula then you have a posterior talofibular ligament okay so these are the ones that are uh, most commonly injured during an inversion ankle sprain now you have a deltoid ligament um, that is commonly injured with the eversion ankle sprain here's a calcaneus Here's the calcaneal tendon, which is your Achilles tendon. Here's the ankle joint. Again, is a uniaxial hinge joint that only allows for dorsiflexion or plantar flexion of the foot. Movements at the subtalar joint between the talus and the calcaneus, combined with motions at other intertarsal joints, enables it to go into inversion and eversion. But the talus and the crural right here just does dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Oh, yeah, this is, uh, you guys saw some good football games this uh, weekend. Look at this. That Yeah, that foot shouldn't 
probably shouldn't be that way. That's that's not the anatomical position, that's for sure. And again, yeah, that ankle probably shouldn't be just hanging like that. Um, this is uh, going to be painful when he lands here. That's not good, you know. If he's got some padding. And then here's some hyperextensions. Um, that's probably not good as well. So there's... Don't know why people play football. I guess it's for the love of the game, but it's going to keep you guys busy. All right. So the table of structural and functional characteristic joints. And so let's start and break it down from the top all the way down to the bottom. So if you look at the skull, what are the, you've got cranial and facial bones. What's the type? They're fibrous. They're suture. Functional type, really no movement there. TMJ joint, what makes it up? That's the temporal bone of the skull and the mandible. Basically, so if you, uh, the whole lecture, you make flashcards of these and you got it. Okay. Synovial, modified hinge, diathroid gliding and uniaxial rotation, slight lateral movement, elevation, depression, protraction. Now you got your first C1, C2, I'm sorry, atlano occipital. So C1 occipital joints, synovial condylar. Okay, what does it do? It allows for flexion and extension. C1 on C2 allows for a small rotation. Then you got your intervertebral joints, which is your vertebral bodies. Okay, they only have slight movements. Uh, diarthroidal, they glide. Okay, so looking at what's the joint What's the bones that make up the joint? Remember, because bones coming together make up a joint. What type is it? And what are the movements that are allowed? Would be a good way to make a flashcard and do really well on the next quiz for this. All right, sternoclavicular joint. That's the sternum and the clavicle. Uh, synovial, shallow, saddle. Diarthroid multiaxial allows clavicle to move in all axes. You have the sternocostal. Sternum and ribs, they don't really have too many, uh, too much movement. Okay, you look at the upper extremity now, you've got the AC joint, that's the chromium of the scapula and clavicle. It's a synovial joint, it allows for gliding and rotation of the scapula on the clavicle. Then you have the glenohumeral joint, which is very useful, basically that's your scapula and your humerus. You've got the synovial joint, which is a ball and socket. It's multi-axial, it allows for flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction, and rotation. So it allows for a lot of movement, so a lot of things can go wrong. There's the elbow, which is the ulna and radius with the humerus. That's a hinge joint, allows for flexion and extension. Then you got the proximal radial ulna, which is the radius and ulna, but that allows for a pivot, which will allow for pronation, supination. You've got the distal radius and ulna. That will allow again for pronation supination. Then you got the wrist that allows for flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. So again, going back, and then you've got your metacarpals. Okay, and now your thumb joint, it's a trapezium and metacarpal one. It's a saddle joint, so you can flex, extend, abduct. Remember, oppose. And remember, the opposable thumb is what makes humans humans. Going down to the lower extremity, you've got the SI joint, which is the sacrum and coxal bones. Uh, um, really, there's not much movement that occurs here. Maybe have too much movement during pregnancy. Then you've got the pubic symphysis. You've got the hip, pubic bones, slight movement. You've got the hip joint, which is key. Again, a ball and socket like the glenohumeral joint. So it does flexion, extension, abduction, rotation. So that's big. Now think about this. Like I was telling you, if you don't have all those actions that can occur at the hip, then you're going to try to get at the knee and the back. Here's the knee, which is the femur and the tibia. Basically, it does flexion, extension. Then you've got the femur and the patella. It just allows for the patella to glide. You get the superior tib fib, which allows gliding of the fibula, so that's always important. You got the inferior tib fib, which again allows slight give during dorsiflexion. So if you if you tape your ankles really tight, you don't give the that dorsiflexion. So sometimes limited mobility can put more stress on the knee. And I'm trying to look for some uh, articles that show that hey, taping your ankles may be more detrimental to your knee than we think. 
Um, so we'll see if there's any research out there. Okay. Again, this is just a review of the principles, uh, the jaw joint, the shoulder joint, looking over this um, would be beneficial. So where are the movements that occur at the shoulder joint? So highlight the shoulder joint, definitely important. What's articulating, what's joining, where are the ligaments found there, where are the tendons found there, what bursa is found there, and what cartilage is found there. This is a great little synopsis for anyone that's treating athletes or treating uh, 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 any sports related injuries, knowing everything that can go wrong at each joint is beneficial. Again, going at the hip, the knee, look at all this stuff that can go wrong with the knee, right? So really focus on the shoulder, really focus on the knee. Okay, so it can go flexion, extension, slight rotation. That's articulation between the tibia femoral and the patella femoral. Look at all the ligaments there. Anterior lateral patella retinac and the medial patella retinac, popliteal, ACL, PCL popliteal, you got the arcuate, popliteal, lateral collateral, medial collateral, what are the bursas, anterior, suprapatellar, prepatellar, I mean this, the knee joint is so complex, no wonder why so many people have knee pain. Uh, so what are some clinical uh, perspectives of all this stuff, put it all together, well you can get rheumatism, rheumatoid arthritis in the joints, any pain in supportive and locomotor organs of the body, bones, ligaments, tendons, muscles. So they would go see a rheumatologist, so which is a physician dealing with study diagnosis and treatment of joint disorders. There's two types of arthritis. Uh, there's wear and tear and rheumatoid arthritis. So arthritis is, the definition is inflammation of the joint. It's the most common crippling disorder in the United States. OA is the most common form of arthritis, wear and tear. You and I are both going to get O and A, especially if you played sports. Uh, crepitus, crunching and cracking sounds of the joints, affects 80% over the age of 70. Now, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, that's our, again, that's autoimmune disease, attacks the synovial membrane. You get ossification of the degenerated cartilage. There's no cure. It's ankylosing, meaning bones become solid, solidly fused and you become immobilized. So that's rheumatoid arthritis. And then if the joints get really worn out, and I'll show you a video of a total knee replacement here, you can have our arthroplasty, which is a replacement of disease joint, artificial device. So they use titanium, sometimes chromium and cobalt. Well, any non-metallic uh, material that will not um, rust, right? <laughs> Or you can have a total hip replacement, first performed in 1963, most common procedure for the elderly. Or you can have a total knee replacement. Uh, um, again, they're infiltrated with the patient's bone, creates a firmer bond. So let me show you a total knee replacement. And again, this is just a review of the joints. The end.